Hello everyone, my name is Giada Viazetti. Some of you might already know me from previous episodes of the podcast. I'm a professor of Spanish language, culture, literature, and translation at Augusta University in Georgia. I'm here today to read uh, two short stories and some poetry written by colleagues of mine in the creative writing program. Um, I'm going to be reading their original version in English, and later we will be reading the translation in Spanish that my students did during their translation class. This is a project that we're working on currently, and it will also be published as a book that includes the original version in English with the Spanish translation. I'm going to start out by reading um, Jim Minnick's uh, short story, Cow Brains, which is also the inspiration to the title of the book that will come out at a later date. Uh, then I'm going to move to um, Spencer Wise and his short story called The Farm. And I'm going to end with Anna Harris Parker's um, poetry. Uh, all of these are beautiful, beautifully written. Uh, they're inspiring, they're funny, and uh, they're also touching, and they're, they have cultural values. So I hope you enjoy, um, and thank you for listening. The Farm by Spencer Wise We're on our way to meet Charlene's family for the first time, listening to Towns Van Zant in the car, and Charlene saying, Pancho and Lefty is me and my daddy's song when I suddenly smell fire. All along Highway 33, the smell of wood burning. She laughs. Don't laugh, I say. Might be a forest fire, she says. First time south of the Mason-Dixon, and now you're Woodsy Owl. I feel vigilant, I tell her, gripping the wheel tight with both hands as we come over a hill and, on the horizon, points of orange flames burst from the tree line. What the hell is that, I say. Those are laurel oaks. Those are pitch pines, she says. Not the damn trees, I say. The fire. We got to call your parents. Tell them it's time to evacuate. We got to get the hell out of Georgia. She puts one hand on my knee and points to the parallel rows in the woods alongside the road, explains how the fire is burning in even rows, how it's controlled. Doesn't look controlled, I tell her. Looks way the hell out of control. Nacris black smoke rises above the pines. She says her parents live about 10 miles from here. Correction, I say. Used to live. It's all burned. You can't go home again. Home is a marsh mellow. Mellow, she says. If you're talking about the spongy confection that you northerners eat two times a year when you go camping, that's a marshmallow. No way. I say it's mellow, as in don't harsh my mellow. You think I'm just some country rube. Your parents probably think I wear a yarmulke, right? When we get to Charlene's house in McClay, Georgia, the sun is fading behind the red barn like the head of a match, smoke curling out of the chimney, and the wisteria is blooming purple. We'd left Brooklyn three days earlier, and now I'm walking on cramped, uneasy legs to meet her father, Eben, who's wearing Carhartt overalls and a plaid shirt, and has the handshake of a grizzly bear. After the introductions, he says, We got a few hours before supper. Come see my cows, Dean. It's just not a sentence you hear in Borough Park. Come stand guard while I hotwire this car. Why don't we huff paint anymore? Yeshiva isn't good enough for your son. He has to be a paint pianist too. But never come see my cows. Over at the barn, Eben pulls open the sliding door, and barn cats scatter in every direction. Inside there is this machine that swivels around like a lazy Susan. The cows walk down a ramp toward Charlene's younger brother, Ted, who's wearing a falcon's cap. He's only 13, Charlene says, and playfully knees her little brother. She's loser here. The cows are moving in backwards to the lazy Susan thing to get milked. Suddenly, Charlene and her mother are gone to pasture, and I realize I'm alone with her father. I'd learn a few things living with Charlene in Brooklyn, where she's a New York teaching fellow, like I learned that hay is made out of alfalfa or grass or clover. This astounds me. Frankly, I thought hay was made of hay, that, is, that it was a legitimate plant one grows. Charlene's daddy, as she creepily calls him, 
strikes me as the sort of man who can go on godly stretches of time without speaking, so I feel obligated to talk. Some of the cows don't have tails, so I say to her father, Are those the females? Are who the females? He's got a real peaceful face. The ones with no tails, I say. He goes bug-eyed for a moment, reddens in embarrassment, then slaps me on the back. You're pulling my leg, right? I tell him yes, of course. He wipes his eyes clear with the back of a dirty finger and explains what he'd done was experiment with tying tight bands on the cow's tails early on, on in their lives. So their tails just withered and fell off in about seven days or so. And that way they don't get caught in the machine. My nausea somehow passes from intense concentration. You're really interested in this stuff, he says. Eben leads me over to the milking station, and this is the closest I've ever been to a cow, though I came close and blew it once before. At my eighth grade field trip to Old Sturbridge Farm, I snuck off with Betsy Braitman, the first and last Jew I ever dated. And while everyone else went to the barn to watch how milk gets made and butter churned, we snuck off to the cider mill where Betsy tried to crush my arm in the wooden screw press. We filled our pockets from the barrels of Baldwins and Roxbury russets, then dug our hands right up to our elbows into the apple pumice sitting in uncovered buckets. We touched the silty, rich, sticky stuff made up of ground skin and seed and flesh before it had been pressed to cider. We were both Brooklyn kids, and we'd seen apples, but not ground up like this. We picked it up, smelled, tasted, sweet and tannic, smeared it like war paint on each other's faces. Then I found a hand saw um, hanging on the wall, and with a sawtooth drew a drop of blood from her finger, a drop that just hung there, quivering and bright. And once I had done the same with my finger, we pressed them tight together, And in all that excitement, we completely forgot to make out. Now I can hear the cows lowing restless. Charlene and her mother return. Ted is down on his knees preparing the cows to be milked, and that's when Eben says, Dean, why don't you give it a try? In my head, I'm thinking there's no way I can do this, but Charlene is right there. Her mouth draws a hard line. I say, no thanks, but then I hear through Charlene's closed lips a soft murmur of disappointment or else irritation. The instant I hear this, I know I am moments away from having cow tits in my hands. Ted hands me a clean rag and a tin bucket filled with warm water and a little bleach, and shows me how to do it. Charlene's eyes are wide, unblinking. Eben puts his arm around her shoulders. The cow jostles about, restless on the platform. Her coat has a heavy scent. She turns and looks back at me with her big b bug eyes, her wondering eyes. This thing before me looks like some swollen, veiny balloon. Reaching out, I wipe it, and through the worn rag, I feel its blood just below the skin. It is warm to my touch, a hot, aching thing. At dinner, we say grace, all of us holding hands. Her father sits there so fiercely quiet and peaceful. Erect and rigid, and without thinking about it, I follow his comportment. At times, we spontaneously turn toward each other and exchange these moronic expressions. Charlene asks for my plate to serve me some Angus steaks. I don't know what that is, but it's fresh. I know it's fresh because it comes from their land. It was a part of them. And I think this is the first time I've eaten a vegetable that I'd seen picked off the vine. When I taste the colored greens, the mother chirps, You like them? As though I were her child using the toilet for the first time. Charlene tells me her mother will give her res the, the recipe if I love it that much. I jump in here, tell them how my grandmother used to intentionally withhold one key ingredient from her chicken soup recipe, driving the women in my family nuts. A different ingredient each time. They all just look at me as if to say, Your grandmother sounds awful. After a brief silence, Eben lifts his single malt and says to me, Shalom, it's great to have you here. Great to finally meet you. They all take turns saying Shalom. Do you read much Torah? The mother asks, her eyes shifting between her daughter and her husband. When I'm not having sex with your daughter, yes, I'm, re I'm reading much Torah. 
Instead, I say, to tell you the truth, my family is not really religious. Charlene is probably more Jewish than me. Charlene is not, the mother starts to say, looks at her husband, then settles for a, well, that drops like a potato sack on the table. This is followed by unnecessary throat clearing and the sound of forks clinking against the porcelain plates. They begin to talk amongst themselves. Ted has blood in his eye from being hoofed in the face a week ago, but it's almost healed. Charlene is dying to be assigned to a special ed class in Bed Sudi next Stui next year. Mother has taken up needlepoint. Eben insists there's no way state legislator can outlaw tail docking. I down another glass of wine, sit back with a full belly after the last gulp has slid down my throat, and think how different this is. No jealousy, no cursing, no farting, no cutting words. They want to watch home videos later. They want to play cards. The mother turns to me, does your religion allow gambling? Later that night, I cannot sleep with the animals going berserk. Giant insects beat their wings against the thick, humid air. Who can sleep with this racket? Besides me, across the room, I can hear her brother Ted snoring away the deep, peaceful sleep of country life. I could have carried his bed out to the barn and he wouldn't have woken up. Charlene and I have been forbidden from sleeping together, so I'm sharing a room with her kid brother. The floor is cold on my bare feet when I stand up, go to the door, turn the knob slowly, and watch my shadow lengthen across the hallway. Down the hall, I pass Charlene's room and quietly push open the door. In the light of the moon, I can see the silhouette of her body, the outline of her nightgown. On my tiptoes, I lean in and freeze when she stirs. While she rolls over, I hear the soft rustling of the sheets. She raises her arms over her head. Above her is a canopy bed, four pleated panels of chiffon curtains. Above the bureau, against the far wall, is an arabesque mirror, curved and bodacious, and slung over its shoulder is a blue sash with the words done in gold leaf, Miss Georgia Peanut Festival 1988. And there's a Led Zeppelin Houses of the Holy poster on the closet door, all this time living with the peanut queen and I didn't even know. My eyes go to her sleeping form. What else don't I know? How does she win the pageant? Does she tap? Beatbox? What was her talent? More importantly, does she still have the dress? And then she rolls towards me. I can see the big banana curls frame her face, stacked like perfectly overlapping shingles. It's her real hair too, not like the orthodox wigs my mother wears to cover her sacramental baldness. Only the best wigs, my father was proud of saying. None of the cheap synthetic ones with cowlicks or mesh caps. None of those wigs 40% off on account of storage smell. Once, as a kid, I saw through the crack of the bedroom door my mother putting on her wig before dinner, and I know I should have not looked, but I stood there frozen. Through the crack of the door... I watched her carefully flip the wig inside out and stretch the lace cap over her head, pink and flaking and wrinkled, her true self. Inside me, something stirred. It was ugly, and I hated myself for thinking so. Then I watched her pull the wig into place, touch her temples to make sure it wasn't crooked. She bobby-pinned the hair behind her ears, checked the mirror for flyaways, and before she could, t- could turn around, I was running down the hall. Closing the door to Charlene's bedroom, I sneak back out to the moonlit hallway, the wood creaking and groaning. I just feel the way of my feet on this old cherry wood that Charlene's granddad hauled out of the woods half a century ago, and I am almost to my room when I hear a voice from the ground floor. Come down if you can't sleep. I find Eben downstairs in the kitchen drinking coffee. That's what a man does. Drinks coffee at midnight out on his porch overlooking a farm. Tomorrow's not a big day because every day is big, the same, and gorgeous. He gives me a mug of chicory coffee, and we go out onto the porch and sit in rocking chairs. It's midnight, and the noise from the insects makes a sound like a heartbeat, like the night itself has a steady pulse. The steaming mug is right below his chin, snuggled up. Bitter, isn't it? He says. Once I've taken a sip and winced. It can be a whole lot worse, he says. 
My daddy used to drink trucker sludge, bacon grease, and coffee grinds. That kind of bitter is barely tolerable. Matched his personality, too. He gives a short laugh, sips his coffee, looks out over the farm, barely tolerable. I tell him, since I've never been out to the country before, never really left the city, sleeping out here is going to be an ordeal. He laughs at that, repeats the word ordeal, as though I have no business using it. You haven't told me anything about your parents, he says. Your parents alive? Do mothers ever die? I joke, and, the, and he sips his coffee, keeps looking straight ahead into the night. Mine did, he says calmly, but he doesn't get angry. He sits there gently rocking with an Old Testament dignity. His cologne smells like horse leather. I want to burrow my head in his shoulder and sniff him forever. Well, what are your folks like? He asks. I thought of my father and mother driving out to see my grandparents in Yonkers for Passover. Whole ride, my mother was farting, driving and farting, apologizing by saying, it's perfectly natural. And my father got his nosebleeds, three of them, in fact. Two there, one on the way back, saying, it is too dry, Hilda. You run the heater and it dries me out. Stop picking, my mother screamed. We pulled over a rest stop so my dad could get some paper towels for his nose. We all went to the bathroom, and when we returned, immediately when my mother closed the door, she farted again. My father said, you wait to get back into the car to do that? My mother says, it's only now arrived. Please, I tell them, shut up, both of you. Everyone, shut up. Nice folks? Eben asks. Very nice, I tell him, and he says he hopes to meet them someday. You'll meet them, I say. That'd be great. We'd love to have them down. I know my parents would never accept that invitation. They wouldn't last five minutes here. I ignore my father's warning in my head. 99% of relationships don't work out. I lean back in the wicker chair, just picturing myself on a tractor. A nice straw hat. You need a hat in these parts. Saying things like these parts. And Van Zandt's in my head, singing about skin like iron, breath as hard as kerosene. And I know he's talking about me. I do pull-ups in the barn, write my children's birthdays in my Bible, capitalize God, and when wisteria weeps its incense, I don't marvel at it. I plow the fields on my tractor and do things out of kindness, I suppose. Cow Brains by Jim Minnick The worst thing I ever ate was cow brains. My grandparents and uncle had just butchered, and my grandmother liked the brains battered and fried with eggs. They smelled good. Maybe it was the eggs and onions, and they looked like very thick pancakes. So I decided to try one. The breading fell off as Grandma served my plate, and suddenly there were the squiggles, those gelatinous gray-white folds that just a day ago had thought grassy, sunshiny thoughts. A red and white checkered oilcloth covered the white kitchen table. Bowls of green beans and potatoes and corn covered the oilcloth. Grandpa, with his bald head, sat at one end, his coffee can spitting at his feet. Uncle Harry, with his curly dark hair, sat at the other. Grandma and I sat beside each other with the round-faced pendulum clock staring down at us. This was the same table where Grandma taught me to play solitaire, where Grandpa sat to knife open his mail and pay his bills, where in the evenings all four of us played pinnacle, Grandma coaching me on which cards to play. I imagine at one point in our human history, we thought eating brains would make us smarter, just like eating asparagus, bananas, honey, and oysters helps our sex lives. Grandma had arthritic knees, so she hitched from side to side when she walked. If the weather worsened her pain, she shuffled her feet. She wore silver-rimmed glasses and loved to quilt even with her swollen, stiff-jointed fingers. Sometimes I'd thread several needles, needles so she could quilt all afternoon without getting frustrated. Uncle Harry, Grandma, and Grandpa already chewed their first bites, so I picked up my fork. During milking, Grandma and I fed the cows. We took turns trindling the two-wheel cart or scooping the molasses-sweetened grain. Usually, she pushed the wagon and read from the chart. Uncle Harry determined how much feed each cow received based on how much milk she gave. And so, as we moved to the next cow, I'd say her name. 
Star or Molly or Betty. And Grandma checked the char chart to tell me how many scoops. Uncle Harry worked on the other end of each cow, squatting to each other to put on and take off the milkers. The pump pulsed a steady thump thump, punctuated by the chittering of barn swallows that hovered over our heads and fed their nestlings. All the while, the hungry cows waited for us, sniffing the grain in big huffs and then licking and chewing with eyes half closed. In these moments, we liked to scratch their black and white foreheads. In the next barn, Grandma and I fed the heifers and steers. The last ones didn't get named, the last ones we ate. Unlike most cows today, our cows had plenty of sun and fresh grass. After every morning milking, unless it snowed, they'd go to pasture, and most afternoons I brought them in, calling Suk Suk Suk, hiking the half mile out to the shady spot where they gathered, tapping their backs with the long stick, waiting as they ponderously rose, gentling them into movement toward the barn, avoiding the tra their trails of shit and fly-flicking tails, making sure the steers didn't turn and, tur and run, and plodding with the slowest, oldest cow in the rear. One of the pastures was also the village's favorite sledding hill. It sloped steeply and at the hinge, Where hill met meadow, we often built rams to carry us airborne for brief moments of yelling joy. But I was a cautious child. I always waited until others had gone down and tested the ramp before I hiked to the top and took my turn. I was also not a very adventurous eater. So why did I say yes to cow brains? Today, I have access to deer brains every fall when I hunt, but they fail to appeal in large part because of the fear of chronic wasting disease, the deer version of mad cow. The fork sliced off a bite, no knife needed. The jelly-like mass held together as the tines poked through. The fork and bite traveled from plate to mouth. What determines if something is the worst or best? Appearance and taste predicted by culture and family, memory and story, all determined by love or its absence. I chewed but didn't really need to. I tasted egg and onion and breading, but the brains? I can't remember, or more likely, they had little flavor, just that slippery, soft texture. And now, four decades later, years of telling others that this was the worst food I'd ever eaten, I'm left wondering if in fact it was the opposite. Grown at home and butchered with care and served with love, I wish I had cleaned my plate. Poems by Anna Harris Parker Lapsed Lutheran The only religion that hasn't failed me The crest of a wave breaks The way it forgives With a reed I sketch my need in the sand Pray as gulls gather round my knees Later I return to Kansas Try to talk to the river Hear the flint hills Where the prairie shakes my faith amid tall grass But between my thumb and forefinger I see where it ends Age 12, my parents trade Grand Strand Beach Houses for Contentment Bluff in McIntosh County, Georgia. I resent the Julianton fluid, contradiction of fresh and salt water with changing tides eroding, the bluff beneath my family's new cabin, which requires sandals in the shower, smoking swisher sweets to keep the mosquitoes at bay. Each spring, the river spits out debris from upstream, waterbeds of grass and reeds decorated with fish hooks and six-pack rings. But then I watch porpoises swim in the wake of Dad's old skiff. Beavers dive into bait buckets on the dock. Horseshoe crabs crowd to mate along the sandbar. I climb fallen trees in the boneyard on the beach of Blackbeard, where wild boars run. Trying. For years, no children. A choice. Favor for a world with too many open mouths, too little water, kindness. Wedding rings make us mind a number of things. Now we worry, dozens of wishes whispered over lemon cake, decades spent pacing spreading pesticides. Twins run in my family, my husband offers. What he means, two birds, just one stone. Mine too, I think. Manic and depression, cocaine and whiskey. Still, I want four birds. 
The book Cow Brains, which will include the short stories by Jim Minnick and Spencer Wise and the poetry by Anna Harris Parker, will be published by Articoli Liberi. It will also include the translations into Spanish that my students did uh, during their translation class. So I want to thank again Articoli Liberi for their support and for making this possible. Grazie.